given his eighth speech. Eighth speech tonight. That's great. It's titled Anti-Fragile. Please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, a big awoo for Mr. Matthew Rayfield. <laughs> Phil Toastmasters, most welcome guests. Over the weekend, I got my trusty Crayola markers, scotch tape, and poster board, and I made a little bit of a book report for you, channeling my inner elementary school student on a book that probably an elementary school student would not be reading. And the name of the book is indeed Anti-Fragile, Things That Gain From Disorder. The author here is Nassim Taleb in a slightly disgruntled picture, as he is slightly disgruntled throughout the book. And the purpose of the book is to explain the meaning of this word and this theory, anti-fragile, and how it affects our lives and implications of not understanding it. And so, Nassim had about 400 pages to explain it. I've only got a few minutes, so I will be started here. Fragile we all understand. This teacup is fragile, brittle, delicate. It doesn't like stress. It just wants to sit on your table and live a calm little life. If you knock it off the table, it'll hit the ground and of course break, or at least crack. Now robust, this cup is more robust, made out of plastic. If you drop it, it probably won't break. You'll still be able to use it as a cup. But neither one of these things is anti-fragile. The opposite of fragile, something that when stress is applied to it actually becomes stronger and in fact your teacup will never be anti-fragile things that are anti-fragile are usually organic in nature so for example human beings are anti-fragile because through exercise which is a form of stressing the body for example this weightlifter here he'll probably be sore the next day but after that, his body will become stronger. And this gazelle here, by itself, is rather fragile because if a lion comes up and eats him, that's the end of it. But the process of the evolving gazelle, evolution in general, is an anti-fragile process because through the stress of the slow gazelle dying when a lion eats it, and the faster gazelle going on, having offspring, the gazelle as a whole becomes stronger through that stress. Restaurants, in a similar way, evolve over time. A single restaurant that sells terrible food isn't going to be around very long. But a, hopefully a better restaurant with better food will move in. And restaurants as a whole, our selection for food gets better. Cab drivers, their careers are anti-fragile. If they're not making much money in one area of town, they just move to the next. Or if they need to make a little more money one day, they have the flexibility and they expect the variability in their income to be able to just work more hours and they can adapt in that way. But much of this book discusses the problems of not understanding that certain things 
become stronger through stress. So for example, in health, if you're exposed to bacteria, to viruses on a small scale, your body builds up its immune system and you become stronger because of it. But if you're to take medicine at the first sign of a cough, let's say, every single time, you'll prevent your body from growing in that way, from building your immune system. And over time, while when you take an antibiotic you might be better, the bacteria are also getting stronger and now we have antibiotic resistant bacteria because of this culture of medication. And the book, the author, Nassim Taleb, calls this naive intervention because as human beings we naturally want to take action when there's a problem. If you went to your doctor and he said, you know, I, let's just wait it out. I'm not really interested in giving you your medication right now. We might not feel satisfied with that. But sometimes no action is the best course of action. And so an example of this was a study done in the 1930s, New York City. 389 children were sent to doctors. Of those, 174 were diagnosed with tonsillitis. And you have the tonsils removed. They took the remaining children who were not diagnosed, 215, sent them to new doctors. Those doctors said, well, of these, 99 need to have a tonsillectomy. And then the remaining 116 were sent to doctors again. And of those children, 52 were told that they need their tonsils removed. There's the phrase, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, apparently, to a doctor in the 1930s, every child looks like he needs to have his tonsils taken out. <laughs> running shoes. For the longest time, all running shoes tried to cushion the foot. They tried to make it so that the foot did not feel pain when it was running, so that it would, could hit a bump of the road and feel nothing. Well, recently, there's been a trend towards running shoes that have a very thin sole, and this allows the foot to adapt the cracks, the bumps in the ground, and through that little bit of stress, the foot actually becomes stronger, you become a better runner because of it. And think about the food, something that we have definitely intervened with. It used to be humans were hunter-gatherers. Sometimes we wouldn't eat at all if we couldn't find food, or we'd have to switch and eat something else. But now, whenever we're hungry, no matter what it is we want to eat, we can go get it. And because of this, because we've intervened and changed the way that we eat food, we have diabetes, heart disease, obesity, all types of problems. The economy is something we certainly intervene with. So going back to that restaurant example, imagine if the government said, if you have a restaurant, and you're not making any money, we're going to bail you out. We're just going to keep paying the bills for you. You can stick around. <laughs> well, that seems rather absurd. Now imagine if they did that with tech companies. We wouldn't have Google or Apple because they would be crowded out by all the terrible companies and they wouldn't be able to rise to the top. Now it seems absurd in these examples, but it happens with big banks. If the government be deems a bank too big to fail, they end up bailing it out, even though they have perhaps terrible practices that are damaging the economy. And so they're preventing that anti-fragility from happening and end up creating a more fragile system. The author Nassim Taleb calls the people that make these policies fragilistas because they take something that otherwise would be anti-fragile and through policy making, make it fragile. So what can we do to prevent all this doom and gloom? Well, one thing is <laughs> make sure that decision makers have skin in the game. Hammurabi's Code, one of the oldest known sets of laws, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, also had a code about home builders. If you built a home for someone and it collapsed on them, you were put to death. So the builders built some pretty strong homes back then. <laughs> they had skin in the game. A more modern example, think about Washington, the government shutdown. Politicians were still collecting their checks, still being paid, <coughs> whereas most of the people in the government were not. 
They didn't have enough skin in the game. They had not enough reasons to really resolve these problems. Another thing Taleb says to avoid is what he calls turkey problems. So imagine that you're a turkey and you've been fed all year long. It's great being a turkey. You've been fed for hundreds of days. And looking back in the past, you say, well, it's great being a turkey. Farmers just love us. Well, what you don't know is that Thanksgiving is right around the corner and the turkey population is about to drop off drastically. <laughs> now, you would have never known that looking in the past. So the story here is try not to base your predictions too much on past statistics because you can't predict the future from the past. Now, how can we become anti-fragile ourselves? One way is what Taleb called a barbell strategy. In the case of investing, this would be something like putting 10% of your money in very risky stocks, let's say, and 90% of your money in very safe assets, maybe that just make a little bit more than inflation. This limits your downside risk to only 10%. If the stock market totally crashes, well, you lost 10% of your money. But if the stock market hits a tear and rises, there's no limit to how much money you can earn. That can just keep doubling, quadrupling, what have you. And the other thing is, think about the cab driver. This woman might have been laid off of work, and she's set up her whole life to expect that weekly paycheck. But the cab driver understands that his life is variable, understands that his income is variable, knows what to do. This woman doesn't because she relies on that paycheck. Now, you shouldn't probably go out and become a cab driver, but it might be good to be aware to think about what would happen if you didn't have that paycheck coming in. And so, the message of my speech and of the book is, like I said, not that you should become a cab driver, not that you should stop seeing your doctor, or that you should go home and reallocate all of your retirement funds, but just that be aware that many organic systems, organizations, actually benefit from a certain level of stress. And perhaps we shouldn't do what we, the natural reaction is to smooth that out. Thank you very much.